Welcome to The Hive Podcast, a new 10-part series with me, Natalina Hai, exploring technology's impact on our personal, cultural, and political lives. Join me each episode as I interview a fascinating array of guests on everything from psychology, surveillance, data privacy, and sex robots, to politics, AI, personality profiling, and much, much more. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube, and join in the conversation with the hashtag HivePodcast. If you enjoy the show, please do give us a rating on iTunes as it helps spread the word and makes it easier for other people to also find this content. And now for the show. Dr. Aaron Valick is a clinical psychotherapist and author of several fantastic books and the director of Still Point Spaces UK, the London-based hub of an international organisation devoted to sharing ideas from depth psychology with the wider public. As a psychological consultant for the media, Aaron has been the resident agony uncle for BBC Radio 1 and CBBC for several years. He recently featured on Radio 4 on The Digital Human, and he's been involved in a variety of projects that aim to bring quality mental health content to programming for young people and for adults. He's spoken at various events on the impact of social media and technology on the individual and society, and has written a fascinating book on the subject titled The Psychodynamics of Social Networking. In this episode, we'll be discovering how technology is impacting our sense of self, society, and the quality of our relationships, and what it means to be caught in the battle between validation and recognition. So, um... I would love to dive in with a very broad question, which is exploring the topic of how technology is influencing us. Um, Perhaps let's start with individuals. So do you find that there's been a shift in the way that people um, present with problems relating to technology, maybe through your practice in recent years? So the interesting thing is people aren't generally presenting technology as something separate from themselves when uh, they're engaging in therapy. So if there's a, an issue with self-image, I will hear about self-image in relation to the self and as deployed across technology. If I hear an issue with uh, relationships, the issue is relationships as experienced by the self and as mediated through technology. So you tend not to get it as a separate item. There's probably one exception, though, where it does seem to arise as a separate item, and that would be dating, I think, and the use of of Tinder um, or other dating apps that uh, I I find people are getting um, stuck in a kind of Tinder dating app uh, shallow whirlpool that um, produces some results and, and not others. And I think it you know, thinking about it now, that 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 seems to be the the outlier. Hmm. So maybe let's start with, start with the the outlier then, because I think that makes for interesting um, listening as well as interesting conversation for us. What is the main impact that sites such as Tinder are having on the ways in which we relate to other people in in dating? Well, okay, so um, I'm gonna be. 45 years old next month. And what I've noticed from a generational perspective is when I was younger and we were dating, that the difficulty was finding a date, going on the first date. Um, and after that, it was much easier. Like you, you, you finally got through the front door, you finally got yourself a date, and then you could have a girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever it is. Today, it's completely the opposite. It's really easy to get a date, if you want to call it that. Um, but it's really hard to get the follow-up. And I think the main issue is that uh, people are either not entirely sure what they're looking for when they go on dating apps, or they are secretly looking for something that they pretend they're not looking for. And I'm talking about the people who end up unhappy on these apps. So um, if you go onto an app like Tinder or any of its brothers and sisters, Um, and you are looking to meet people, and you're looking for it to be casual, and you're probably looking for a casual sexual encounter as well, and you're looking for it perhaps not to develop into anything serious, then you're in the right place. Mm. All of that stuff is really easy. To go the next, if you're looking to build a relationship, um, I think you're 
while I think it does happen across these networks, I think you're kind of in the wrong place for two reasons. First of all, there are too many options. So there are too many people on the network. There's too much choice. It's the, um, uh, the, 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 the overstimulation of choice. So you could be on a date with someone that's pretty much good enough, but you know, who's to say that the next person you see isn't going to be even better. The second reason I think is an implicit culture across these networks, which is you don't want to take it too seriously. So you have the, the rom-com result where you have two individuals who would actually like to take it further, but they're pretending to each other and themselves like they don't. <laughs> and then that ends up in disappointment. One of the things that's really interesting about these sorts of networks is that for them to be popular enough to get people to use them, they have to be used by enough people for the network effect to take hold, for other people to be attracted. And by that point, you've got the problem of scale, which is if you have too many options, then we're much less likely to make choices that actually serve us, that are aligned with our values, etc. Or we just get paralyzed. Um, are there any hacks that you've found that can help deal with these things? Or do you think actually it's the platform's design and the scale of it that makes it very difficult to hack? Uh, well, I mean, you know, as a psychotherapist, my, my sort of work all life hack is, you know, insight and honesty with yourself. Know, know what you're in it for and know what you're doing. So if you're engaging in the same behavior over that network in a place that lands you feeling empty and unhappy and needing more, then, then have some insight about that and say, oh, okay, either, either the network isn't working, the app isn't working, or the way I'm using that app isn't working, and think again. Mm. Um, I have nothing against sex as recreational activity, uh, serial dating as a social activity, but if you're, if you're engaging in that behavior, but you're actually looking for something more, you're, you're going to get more of what, what you're going to get, if you, if you see what I mean. So in yeah. a sense, it's like, okay, decide if it's working for you, if it's not working for you, can you use the app in a different way? Or do you need to be doing something completely different that's going to put you in the ballpark for the kind of relationship that you're looking for? Okay, so that's kind of Tinder. We've uh, explored that very briefly. What are some of the other ways in which technology shapes the way that we perceive ourselves and that we present ourselves to others? Okay, so I, I think that the, the biggest single issue is the distinction that I make between uh, validation and recognition. Hmm. And very, very briefly, validation is, you know, a pat on the back, a well done, you look nice today kind of a thing. Whereas recognition is, I really see who you are. Um, I really like who you are. And there's some stuff that I don't really like about you, but I'm still, in a, I'm still relating to you. You're a different human being from myself. We encounter conflict and difference. I see how you're different from me and I still respect you. Yeah, so it's a little bit more nuanced. It's a little bit more complex. Um, and it's actually functionally what human beings need emotionally and psychologically. So you imagine parenting, which is a really good example. Um, you know, parents don't always like their kids. Yeah, <laughs> kids don't always like their parents. Uh, partners don't always like their partners. But you, you have a relationship with the whole person, ideally. Mm. When we go online, um, we appeal to validation more than recognition because that's what online gives us. It gives us likes. It gives us retweets. Um, it, it gives us uh, followers. Um, all of these things are kind of low nuance, low complexity strokes of, of the ego, in a sense, mm. and feel really good. But they're not recognition. And when people get lots of validation and not enough recognition, there are consequences. And I think what we're seeing on an individual and cultural scale all over the place is a culture that's being built upon validation at the expense of recognition. And so I wonder if this ties into um, some of the more recent pieces of research that's looked at, for instance, levels of self-reported loneliness in the States or the um, reports of people feeling a lot more depressed or anxious or lonely, having spent greater amounts of time on social platforms such as Facebook, for instance. Do you think that ties into this, um, this thesis of kind of it being too much validation and not enough recognition? I think it does. Um, you know, in, in, 
psychoanalysis, we understand this concept. Um, it's a, it's kind of got a, I, I don't really like the, 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 the name of it, but it, it's called the false self. And basically what the false self is, is it's, um, it's how we manage our parents when we're infants and children. The, you know, the example I like to give is if you were a baby and you're crying a lot um, and that brings your mother's attention, then you learn that, you know, crying brings your mother's attention. But if you find out that crying makes your mother anxious, you will learn instinctively to cry less because you don't want to make your mother anxious. So even though your, say, your authentic true feeling is to express distress, you know that your distress makes her distress, so you kind of learn not to express your distress. And that's the development of the, the false self. I'm, I'm not going to be distressed because that will make them distressed. Now, psychoanalysts are very much in agreement that we all need a false self. It helps us adapt to reality. It helps us adapt to other people. It helps us avoid conflict. It, it encourages um, social cohesion, you know, because everybody's not just doing their own thing all the time. Where you run into trouble is when you kind of believe your false self to be your whole self. Yeah. So your adapted position becomes all of who you are rather than just an aspect of yourself. Hmm. Social media, for the most part, not all of it and not all of the time, um, enhances aspects of the false self because it's a virtual performance of yourself in a public environment. And because of mobile technology aiding and abetting false self, because we can do it on the bus, do it at the bus stop, you know, looking at our smartphone between every single pause, looking for the likes and the retweets and the followers we become attached, you know, that, that false self manifests itself bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. So even, and this is the, this is the real kicker, I think, because uh, this happened long before um, technology, but uh, even a successful false self getting all of the validation and applause it needs results in a lonely person behind it because that is validation, not recognition, and the aspects of the self that need to be seen and loved are invisible. Hmm. And that's loneliness. It sounds to me like this plays in a bit to or connects with um, narcissism so from a clinical perspective, the idea that we become so enamored with this shell self um, to kind of almost compensate for this void or this mm. existential, uh, this lack of existential recognition that mm -hmm. you are enough as you are just for being, that kind of unconditional side of things. Um, it, it, do you think, I don't know, well, you're the psychotherapist, you tell me. <laughs> the, the problem with the word narcissism is how it's publicly understood, which is usually a little bit incorrectly. Mm. People think it's about how much people love themselves, and that's why they're promoting themselves, yeah? Um, narcissism emerges from what's called the narcissistic wound. And the narcissistic mm. wound comes from parenting in which the parent sees the child how they wish the child to be rather than how the child actually is. And then just like with the development of the false self, it's very, you know, the, the two things are intertwined. The child begins to learn, well, if I'm like this, this is, this is where the, the strokes come. This is where the, the prizes are and feels like the spontaneous, authentic aspects of the cells aren't worthy, aren't wanted, so you're constantly compensating for that, that loss. Mm. So the more narcissistic you are, in a sense, and you know, certain world leaders come to mind, uh, <laughs> the deeper the wound is of the lack of recognition from, from the earliest time. Wow, and so is there something to be said for the idea that if we don't experience that sense of recognition early on, then we don't know how to seek it because all we've had access to is validation. And that's the thing that then people with this wounding will perpetually hunt out. P pretty much. Yeah. Um, I mean, all of us, because all of us have false selves, we all have narcissistic wounding and it's a matter of how, how wounded we are and how misrecognized we were as children and how our innate character, you know, responds and deals with that. But uh, on the opposite side of the coin, you know, is a challenge to the idea that social media or Instagram or whatever it is makes us narcissistic. Because the fact of the matter is our, our narcissistic disposition is online, you know, long before we come onto social media. Whether it exacerbates it or not, I think is a fair question. And I think, yes, it does. And I think we do live in an exhibitionistic, self-referential, narcissistic culture, which is why we've created the social media that, that we have. 
So it really does overlap. But I think the good news is if you're if you're coming from a good enough parenting background and your narcissistic wounds aren't so huge, um, you can make smarter decisions about the temptations towards narcissism online. Um, if the wounds are quite large, living in a social media environment isn't going to do you any favors. You know, what, what you really, really need is the hard graft of complex interpersonal relationships where they're seeing your complexity rather than your, your false self. Mm. So how might one be able to tell if this applies? So for everyone listening, um, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, hang on, well, how do I know uh, if maybe I should spend less time on social media? How do I know how wounded I might be? Mm -hmm. um, is there a way of perhaps sensing that out? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's what I call listening in, you know, um, if you're, okay, so what, what often happens in relation to social media is we fill a void with it anyway. So we're bored, or we're anxious, and then the phone comes out of the pocket, and then the scrolling begins. Yeah. Mm. And then the scrolling begins, and it continues, and it continues, and it continues. And then you start to have a kind of a feeling, like, an empty feeling or a bored feeling. And sometimes we ignore that, you know, we ignore that when, you know, we're eating food we really like, and it starts to make us feel sick, and we eat it anyway, we ignore it when, you know, we, we watch something on Netflix, then we watch the second thing, and then we watch the third thing, <laughs> you know, it's like, maybe I don't want to be doing this. Now, all of these things aren't about narcissism. But um, if you are hot to what's going on inside you, you become aware that your activities are not making you any happier, they're making you feel worse. And I would say even before you get to the activity, I think it's a good idea to stop before you even pick up the phone when you're feeling A, bored, or B, anxious, and maybe wonder what feeling might emerge if you don't distract yourself immediately with social media. And if that feeling is loneliness, what would it be like to make another choice for a high complexity relationship with a real person in your real social network instead of logging on? So reaching out to a friend, going and having a cup of coffee or whatever it might be. I think so, you know, and, and you know, I think that that's what I call like a nourishing relational encounter. And when you need a nourishing relational encounter, don't go to find it on Facebook. We need a nourishing, complex relationship with another human being. You know, you might find that on Tinder, but it's not the most likely outcome. So, you know, you want to make some some choices. You know, if if you want a cheeseburger, every once in a while, get a cheeseburger. And you can get a cheeseburger through Facebook and you can get a cheeseburger through Tinder. But if you want a nice, nourishing meal that's going to make you feel really good, Think carefully about where you're going to find that. Mm. But it's, it's one of these funny things because I know that, you know, we, we all have um, some understanding, I think, and thanks to the way that the public discourse is changing around this, as to how social media can sometimes harm our sense of well-being. But it's something which we still um, are very reticent to give up. And, I, you know, I've, I give talks on this about how uh, these interfaces are designed to be persuasive or addictive um, what constitutes ethical versus non-ethical use, mm -hmm. where the grey line is, and you know we can make our own decisions about where that might be. But it's all great in theory, and yet, um, even though my Twitter use has gone down, I'm no longer on Facebook. I haven't been on there for like five or six years. I still check my phone, and it's it's um yeah. And while I'm doing it, I still think, oh yeah, but I could be doing something else. Or and it's it's this sense of wanting some kind of reward or arousal. Um, by arousal, I just mean something like excitement as opposed to sexual arousal, although I'm sure you can find it on your phone as well. But it's that, it's this kind of this conditioning that if we want some sort of pick-me-up, that's where we're going to find it. And, and it's quite hard to break that conditioned pattern. I mean, you know, nice choice of words, conditioned pattern. You know, it, it is a conditioned pattern. We condition ourselves and, and the, the products are built in a way that enables us to do that. Um, look, I, I've learned to have a relatively okay you know, diet. I, I, I like the diet metaphor because it just <laughs> works for me. But, you know, if there's a, if there's a tube of Pringles in my house, th they will go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, if they're not there, I'm not going to eat them. Mm. And in some ways we have to get ahead of ourselves because it's like 
with our smartphones because they do everything. It's like having a, a cabinet full of all of the lovely snacks you like all the time. Mm. So you, your better self, in a sense, has to get out in front. Now, I'm not against Facebook. I'm on there too. I'm on Twitter. I'm on lots of them. Um, but you want to think about like, you know, and, and you can get some apps that do this. You know, uh, my, my phone will be on airplane mode, for example, for, for most of the day. Um, you know, if I'm really desperate, I can take it off of airplane mode and, and check my apps, but at least I've like, I put a little barrier in front of it. It's like not filling the house with the bad habit food. And I think our better selves sometimes have to get in front and say, well, I need to actually reduce my capacity to access this thing because I don't trust myself not to access it if it's there. Yeah, I have the same thing with Maltesers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, okay, so we've talked a little bit about social media and dating. Um, an area that I am keen to explore with you is it's related to surveillance and the idea that if we feel like we are constantly on, either sharing stuff consciously through social platforms or being listened in on or, uh, I guess, having our digital behaviour tracked by whatever programmes are tracking us, whether it's you know, cookies or ads or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. um, how does our sense of being tracked and watched shape the way in which we grow and develop as people? Really, really good question. And it's making me think of, of two different tracks, one of, that, one of which I hadn't thought about before. I'm going to save that for a second. But the first one, so the first one is about what we do how we justify certain things in our own heads, right? And in, in psychoanalysis, this, this term is called disavowal. Yeah, which is like, I like to call it denial light. So <laughs> <laughs> it's not like, it's not like we're acting as if it never happened, but we're acting as if we don't really know it's happening. So we all know, but we kind of do it anyway. Yeah, we know that our internet service provider can find out uh, everywhere we've been, that our mobile phones track us, that all of it. And we do a little trick in our mind that says, hmm. I don't really care or it doesn't really matter. And I think there's some evidence to say in the present sense, who knows when it would change, that it probably doesn't matter. Um, it might be that if somebody said um, somebody, you know, can have access to all of the pornography you're watching and they know exactly what search terms you're looking at and they know how long you've been watching it. You know, it's a pretty terrifying thought. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, People, most people don't care what kind of pornography you're, watch, you're watching, you know, unless, unless you're paying them for it. And most people don't care what kind of books you're buying unless, you know, the, the, the will is a, it's a profit driven will. So in a sense, unless, and I think it's a real fair, fear, you know, unless the, um, the safety infrastructure of our nation state changes and we, we move back to like a, an East Germany kind of a thing. And I think, you know, there's probably some, you know, some fair worries that that could happen at any time. Um, where where our governments will use that stuff against us. Mm. That's where the fear is. But in this very moment, I think we, we justify ourselves out of, of that situation. I, I think people are under the impression that there is no real danger in kind of uh, corporate bodies knowing everything about us. No real danger. We, we're uncomfortable with it. We don't like it. Um, but there's not a sense of impending doom yes that could change of course governments could change and then suddenly the stuff could be used against us you know and i don't think it's an accident that you know germany has some of the um, most rigid privacy um policies because of their experience of of east germany mm. so that's that's the one level the disavowal level yeah we know but we try not to care about it too much we try not to think about it too much because it's inconvenient to do so yes so the second issue, which I hadn't really considered deeply until you asked the question, is how imagined audiences operate within surveillance culture, huh. which occurs to me in this moment, it's pretty, can I say pretty fucking pernicious? Yeah, you can say that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fucking pernicious, actually, because, because we are so embedded in our social media world in which we kind of carry our imagined audience around all the time. So it's like you see something and you think, um, you know, I could Instagram that shit or I'm going to tweet that or, you know, there's like there's this part of your mind, I think for most of us anyway, mm. uh, who are on social media where you're thinking about 
how something might come across social media. Yeah, I hate having that presence in my mind. <laughs> it's, it's terrible because because then you know you're really in false self, aren't you? You're really in like a being for other people to see, which is not always you know it's not a great position to be in all the time. And also, you're you're almost experiencing yourself through the view of the other so you're not even properly embodied at that point you're just kind of seeing your experience as a performance so it's not even um fully lived i think yeah you you become the um the, the object of your own public narrative um <laughs> which you know might be fun at times but you don't want it as a permanent position mm. but the question then arises if we have got so used to carrying around an imagined audience then maybe the way in which we're surveilled becomes much more palatable. Oh, and that's such a horrible thought, this idea. It's one thing that I've explored a little bit with one or two other people in the series, but um, the Orwell versus Huxley view of the future in Orwellian yeah. uh, futures, it's kind of this dystopian view of a boot stamping on the human face forever. Whereas in Huxley's, yeah. it's a lot more kind of based on entertainment and our sense of just, well, fuck it, it's fine. Let's just walk straight into this and isn't everything fun? Um, which is kind of where our society is, I think, on the spectrum. I mean, we're not completely there yet, but it's certainly more in that direction, as far as I can tell. We, we yeah, I mean, I, I wrote a blog post about this a couple of years ago, I think, looking at looking at Huxley and, and Orwell, and, and really coming to very similar conclusions that you know, we we have gone the Huxley route, and not just in relation to technology, but in relation to um, medication and distraction and sex. And uh, science is kind of moving that way too, um, you know, uh, genetic editing and that sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, when genetic editing increases and it's going to be very expensive, then we kind of have our alpha, beta, theta situation developing as well. It's terrifying. I mean, I know that in this particular series, we're, we're dealing more with the present situation and we're not even getting on to the sort of the, the grander dystopian visions of what can happen when we start really interfering with the building blocks of humanity but it's it's yeah I mean this is basically whatever we're doing now is going to set the foundations for the future that we're going to build absolutely I mean you know the 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 the, the, the snowball is rolling down the hill you know I heard I heard uh just this morning that you know they think we're we're 10 maybe 15 years away from being able to use DNA to store digital information oh yeah I read that that's insane it's it's insane and fascinating because it kind of makes you think about now. And you know, we are we are DNA um, information machines already. Huh. You know, we 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 just don't know how to use DNA to hold other information. But when you think, you know, that that's basically what we are as human beings. You know, DNA information machines. Um, it doesn't not make sense. We are data stores of of our experience. We're data stores of our memory. Um, you know, I got into quite a heated argument with another psychotherapist the other day when I suggested that, you know, we're basically very complex algorithms. And they said, that's a very dark nihilistic thing. And I said, well, look at look at what psychotherapy is. It's a conversation in which you hope one person's dialogue will alter the other person's internal world in a positive way. Hmm. And you can see that as two different algorithms in conversation with each other. And and changing the structure of the algorithm through interaction. Mm. So um, it doesn't have to be nihilistic to reconsider uh, how information processing works um, on the on the what we understand as the human scale or the binary scale. Mm. Yeah, it's communication of information across bodies. So beautifully put. Actually, that connects um, also to the idea of being able to use increasingly our physical selves to act as passcodes with all the biometric stuff that's possible. So palmed prints, heartbeats, irises, all of that. Yeah. And, and also, yeah, how that fits into big data. So I, I think um, so that then we run into basically a, a profound issue of trust. Right. Hmm. So. Because we live in a, in a capitalist society, uh, we know that the motivation for big data and how it's used ends up being profit. Um, I think that, that that scans pretty closely to, to humans over time, whatever system, you know, whatever system you want to look at. Uh, it, it's kind of how desire 
operates. Mm. So the fear is, you know, you're going to use big data to maximize profit no matter what the consequences are. Mm. Yeah, the tobacco model, let's say. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to sell you cigarettes even though they kill you because it's going to make me lots of money. Oh, yeah. But imagine a situation in which uh, the NHS and Costco and Tesco and your local mini market are sharing all of this information and then suddenly work out that, you know, um, let's use both of our sins, Pringles plus Maltesers plus a certain fabric softener plus uh, travel to a certain area and uh, a certain cotton polyester combination <laughs> has been producing liver cancer in a number of people. Hmm. Yeah, so like suddenly you're, you're, you're using information from a whole variety of different data points that no human being would ever independently consider. And mm. then it's like, okay, there's something about this combination that's resulting in this consequence. And that's like a brilliant use of, of big data because we'll never find that on our own. So then it really does hinge on transparency and trust and then who owns one's data and the willingness we have to share our data where the exchange is something that we're comfortable with. But I think that's the crucial question is how do we get to a position where that's what we're dealing with, where we actually have a say in the way that our data is harvested, made sense of, correlated across other data sets, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there are lots of models for this and it's definitely not my, my area of expertise, but it, it seems to me that's going to be on, on, a, on a sort of a policy level mm. um, that, that somehow you can find some basic principles that, um, you know, it's, 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 I guess it's also sort of like the opt in and opt out of, um, you know, organ, organ transplant. You know, you want the, you want the, the base level opt in to be productive for the whole of humanity. Yeah. That should be the ideal goal. And it's just unfortunate that, that profit and human beings better good aren't always aligned. Uh, they're often or frequently not aligned. Um, when they are aligned, you get some pretty pretty amazing things. You also get some pretty amazing things happening kind of on their own. You know, we, we, we as a as a species eradicated smallpox. You know, in the 1970s, through through <laughs> identifying a vaccine and then identifying a way to get it in the places where it was needed most, and now nobody gets smallpox anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, we stopped using chlorofluorocarbons to seal up the um, uh, the ozone hole. Um, so I do think, you know, there's enough optimistic evidence out there to think that we could, you know, we, we could utilize this kind of information and this kind of technology for some amazing good very quickly because it's moving so fast. Of course, I think the, th the two things that come to mind for me uh, with the British government, one thing that could get in the way is utter ineptitude, leaving things on trains like USB keys that then enable people to access all the data. Mm -hmm. um, and two, the extraordinary lack of comprehension around encryption and how important it is specifically for sensitive data, never mind all the other stuff. Um, so I think unless those two problems get somehow solved, uh, it's going to be pretty tricky to move forward in a way that's going to be helpful to the most number of people. Well, I think that's right. And I think that's part of the trust issue. And it, I think it's kind of a funny, you know, because basically, if, if you know how to code and, you know, you're in, you know, you're in Apple rather than in government, that's that, that's who you've got to trust at the moment. Right. you got to trust mm -hmm. people who know what the hell they're doing. And uh, it just so happens that we live in a time where governments actually um, have the least amount of trust in while there's some suspicions around companies like Apple, I imagine people probably trust Apple more than they trust the Trump administration in the state. Yeah. Perhaps, you know, perhaps people trust GCHQ more than they trust the, the government itself. I, 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 don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but, you know, it's the knowledge holders that have the power. And I think we have to, we have to really hope that the people who have that knowledge also have a robust ethical system and how they want to deploy that. And of course, there are no guarantees that's going to be the case. Oof, yeah, and if the present um, situation and recent past is anything to go by in the way that Silicon Valley is kind of now, I suppose, lying in the bed it's made, it's, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about my optimism around that. Um, I'm also conscious of the time. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to wrap this up by asking you three questions. The first of which is, what is your greatest concern for the future? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there are too many to count. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 
my greatest concern for the future is that we are so overloaded with information that I think we're not getting our priorities straight. So money flows to places that, uh, you know, can, where the most viral campaign is happening at the moment, not necessarily where something needs to happen. And I would feel much better if there were some grand sifting process <laughs> that kind of said this, you know, plastics in the ocean, for example. Um, yeah. uh, and, you know, and who am I to say that's a priority, but it seems to me, you know, since going throughout the entire food chain, it, it probably is, mm. but um, that, that we're so distracted that, that, that we're losing a sense of, a priority and B what our responsibility is to those priorities and C what is the best way we can club together to resolve some of the major issues that are affecting the, the planet today. Mm. Yeah. Okay. What is your greatest hope for the future? I can have quite an optimistic hope in humanity. I'm currently <laughs> reading Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now book. Tim, he also wrote, uh, you know, Angels of Our Better Nature, um, where he goes on through a series of, you know, a lot of evidence to show how, how human beings actually have been getting better and better over time, killing each other less, fewer wars, hardly any famines anymore. Um, you know, that actually the trajectory might look pretty good. Hmm. There's a lot of criticism of his work in this area. Uh, nobody denies that there are a lot of problems, but the examples I gave you before about uh, smallpox in the ozone hole may give me a sense that, you know, sometimes uh, the will towards health on the global scale can, can win out. I like to think so. It's interesting that, we're, uh, that your, your concerns and your hopes are around our place on this planet and what we can do to help make sure that it thrives um and i of course technology i think can play a role in that if you okay if you could give people one action that they can take today to fight for this future what would it be so probably something i said a little bit earlier about um insight and being honest with oneself um it's kind of interesting that i answered your two previous questions on a kind of global scale when actually my main job is to work one-on-one -on -one with individuals. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of surprised me there. Um, but I think when people are quiet with themselves, insightful about what their needs are, what their vulnerabilities are, um, their relationships with those closest to them and, uh, honest with themselves about the answers that they get about the questions they ask themselves about that, uh, people make better choices. Mm. I would kind of say, stop fooling yourself. I mean, we all do a lot of the time, but take some time out to stop fooling yourself, find out what your needs are, find out honestly what the real needs and desires of those are that are close to you. Have an honest conversation and take it from there. Thank you for listening to The Hive Podcast with me, Natalie Nahai. To find out more about today's guest and the topics we explored, you can find resources and links on the show notes page at natalienahai.com forward slash The Hive Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please do give us a rating on iTunes and join in the conversation with the hashtag Hive Podcast. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to sharing more with you in the next episode.